you want to reserve currents, let's try again. So now Schwinger, this is story before this time. So Schwinger used to have some 15, 20 students at the time. So most of his students met him on only two days. On the first day when he suggested a problem to them, and on the last day when he signed their thesis. So the students are expected to do their work on their own. Of course, it is true that he had students like Coleman and Bashar and so on, who <coughs> didn't need to be guided. But uh, that's the, this, so the problem he gave to his student, Bashar, was that look here on the weak interaction, and you can see, see that the environment should be conserved. So why don't you try and find that problem? So that led to Bashar's work, and that eventually got his Nobel Prize. So this is what we will talk about on the time today. And so, uh, the must be asymmetry. The first thing that Kleshka realized that this cannot be a dual asymmetry like you. Why not? Because the gauge goes on here, the W goes on, is charged. The photon is neutral. But a charged gauge photon is a complex object. So, complex field means that there are two fields, there are two real fields. So, you could have the W plus, which is W1 plus I W2, W1 minus I W2. W minus, so there are two W bosons. Now, what is the meaning? So if I think in terms of the gauge theory, so what was the role of the photon? And this del B theta <coughs> and I put in the A new to cancel the del B theta. So if I have two A new, what does that mean? There must be two theta. So that means that when Mashuk. I write the corresponding transformation, there must be two theta. Why do I need two theta? There must be two generators of the group, at least. So therefore, this group must have at least two generators. Okay, so there must be at least two generators. There could be more, but so if it's two generators, it automatically becomes a uh, higher group, not simply a one. Okay. The next argument for that is that we have four fermion theory with this vertex. So I have already wrote that. Two e's, e new, e new. So just as you can have E nu scattering to E nu, which we looked at, you could also have E plus E minus scattering to a pair of neutrinos. All right? It can happen either way. Point of difference allows you to do that. And if you have that, how will this look in the intermediate vector bosons? E plus E minus going to pair of neutrinos. But now the W boson you have here, what is this charge? Zero. Zero. So it's neither W plus nor W minus. There's always a possibility to have a neutral W also. <coughs> so if you have a neutral W also, that means one more field. So therefore, this W, why can't this be the photon? Because it comes to neutrinos. Neutrinos are neutral. Photon cannot come to neutral one. So, this, so therefore, there must be three generators, at least three So this group of gauge symmetries must have at least three generators. It could have more of course in principle. But of course, you don't assume extra things to so make your life difficult. So try the next simplest unitary group after you work, and that is assumed. This is assumed to work. So it does have three generators. Okay, so I hope all of you are familiar with SU2. If not, you can briefly discuss it. The, the three generators of SU2 are the three Pauli matrices divided by two. So, this it was a natural choice. So Glashow thought, and actually this, this is the only thing which we got to do, why don't you try and assume to this here? So that's the only hint he got for his thesis. Okay. So with this, let's see what happens. So now, in order to understand this, let's look at what happens, how to uh, set up a non-abelian gauge theory. So that's now what I'm going to discuss. So this, of course, is also called the gauge theory. So let's assume that really, almost the same formula, is it? Suppose you have instead of one uh, field phi, you have a set of fields, phi 1 to phi small n, and each of these is a complex theta. So instead of a single phi, you have this multi this n plate of scalar fields, complex scalar fields. Now, you construct what we call, we call a free Lagrangian density like this. So this looks exactly like Instead of a star, now I put the dagger, and these are now these multiplets. Okay. <laughs> so if I write this out in full, how will it look? This is a short time for writing this sum over all the fields. So what is it like? All these fields 
each of them is a prefix, only special things that they have the normal mass term n. So these are mass degenerate prefix. So therefore, whenever you have <coughs> a number of mass degenerate prefix, you can always <coughs> put it in a particular place.
global network. So they tell me you will not touch you. You can just come out of this. So if you do that, so the u dagger comes out of this, u dagger comes out of this, you have u dagger u, you have u dagger u. u is unitary, so that means u dagger u is one, and therefore we get back the same energy. So the way they are distributing the runtime, and just to write it for a single field, it shows you that the structure with the masses as well as the masses are regenerated. This is invariant under an SU <laughs> Okay, it comes automatically with the structure of the world. Only thing is the message should be the same. Okay. Now that you have this, okay, I will show you this. And corresponding, this should be now three number of conserved currents. Alright, so you could now write down the same, do the same formalism <coughs> which I showed you, and, and do that as an exercise. You could do it and show that there are p number of conserved currents corresponding to the p number of symmetries. So no other currents for that. All right, let's go a step further. So the next step, then, <coughs> I'm just following what I did for you. From the global symmetry, I now go to local symmetry. Same argument, global symmetry, <coughs> to be compatible with relativity, if you want to make a physical change, make it a local symmetry. So your u now becomes u of x, u dagger is u dagger of x. In the same way, I plug it into the I plug this into the plugin. But now I have dealt you U daggers here. This will be remain unchanged, <laughs> but here now the del will plug into U. You can't stop there new here. So just as it happened for the uh, case of the U1. So result is but now be careful in doing the calculation because you need to keep the ordering things, okay? Because you have matrices now. So you can't just pull them out of this left and right as you wish. You have to keep the ordering. So I have done the ordering carefully. So here uh, you have this is del mu of u times phi. First, phi operates in the phi, and here it operates in the u. So there are two terms here and here. So the, again, I use global thing. So this one is there. Okay, I'll written this out in full. So what I did here is that I multiplied by u dagger, okay, and I took the u outside from here. <coughs> so that's what I got u dagger here, okay. This one I wrote as u dagger and then I took the u outside. So uh, once you've written this, now this u dagger u is one. So I am left with this condition. Okay. So earlier I had just put n u dagger. So now we have this more complex. So I thought I had this del mu theta here. So now I have this more complicated object here, but it's similar. Same thing. And clearly, this is not going to be equal to the original effect form. Because there will be extra terms. So exactly as for you one, you don't have uh, local case. How do we get that? Solution is the same. Define a covariant derivative now. <coughs> and define a covariant derivative where in addition to the derivative, you have added, now I have kept the unit matrix here. Okay, there should be unit matrix, because it's a matrix, you have added matrix to the matrix. So, uh, you add a gauge field. Except that this is not a gauge field, but it's an n by matrix of gauge fields. Okay? So there are all these fields inside. <coughs> now, of course, you want this to be Hermitian, so the NU is Hermitian, so not all these fields are independent. It's not two n squared fields, and we come to it. Let's find out how many fields are independent. We'll come to that. But uh, we do put we'll this gauge matrix in. Gauge field matrix. So what do we want? We want the covariant derivative to transform exactly like the field. We've seen that earlier. If it transforms exactly like the field, you have invariance. Mm -hmm. So we want this one. So just as the field goes with your u, the covariant derivative should transform to u. For now, if you write the Lagrangian density like this, so there will be u and a u dagger here, there will be u and a u dagger here, and Okay, so I want to ensure that once I will the covariant derivative in this form, it should transform like this. How do I do that? How did I do it for u1? I did it by choosing the transformation of a to be a u plus a. So I'll play the same game here. 
to ensure this, we will adjust the transformation of the data stream matrix. So how do we do that? Back calculation. <coughs> so you write dnu5, we'll go to this. So dnu plus nu prime and phi prime is nu5. Okay? All right. So dnu acting on u5 plus ib nu prime on u5. Take the derivative, you get two terms. One for dnu x on u, one for dnu x on phi. Is a vector of a times t, 
to write out the interaction terms and the Lagrangian transform. How do we do that? See, this is the Lagrangian It looks very compact, but it isn't. Okay, it's only compact because of the notation. This mu has this big annual matrix sitting inside. So let's write it. Here is the mu with the annual matrix. And now what do we have here? So the d mu phi and the d mu phi together will give you this term and this term together. That's your free scalar. That's what you had before you wanted about double gated things. Then there will be the d mu phi times the a mu term. The cross terms. There will be two terms like this. This is what I did with this both ways the the corresponding thing. In this case, there's the gate scalar interactions. And there will be the product of these terms, last term, which are the C bar terms. But remember that I can't write phi dagger phi here. These are matrices, so I have to keep the order correct. <coughs> so even the structure is different. Okay? This, for example, is a column matrix. This is a row matrix. These are square matrices. Similarly, everywhere, this is a column matrix, row matrix, square matrix. So that structure has to be maintained. You have to be careful that you're doing it. So if you find that you've written it on the wrong side, always remember the structure. Then we remember how to put the uh, things. OK. So. Remember, we should also complete the Lagrangian density by adding a kinetic term. So this you will be careful because the kinetic term is invariant because A mu transforms in slightly different ways, not just plus del mu. The thing which you get here, you have to write the co the, the commutator of the two covariant derivatives. So that expands to this. So if you write these in terms of the A mu phase, you will also get the. <coughs> now these are matrices. In U1, this would be 0 because numbers must come here. But if they are matrices, they won't come here. And the generators are there, which don't come here. So therefore, you will get this one. So how does this transform? So you know how DMU phi transforms. So it goes to this. And you can get DMU phi transforms to this. OK. Thus, if you now write F mu nu as this, then both of these will transform to this. So you can take the, put the u's outside, each will multiply them, the u's other and u's will get each other inside. So you will get this. Now, so that means if you take two f mu u's, if you take f mu and f mu u, the u dagger u will cancel, but you will still get u and u dagger on either side. For that to cancel, you should take the trace. Because of the trace, I can bring the u dagger back again. So the full Lagrangian density is now this. And this is because ultimately you will, the two by two matrices, so you will get trace of one. So trace of one unit matrix is two, so you want, don't want that extra two hanging around, so you put an out. So I have this system for the non negative gain. Notice something that this F mu F mu, F mu has two terms now. There is this term which is like U1, and there is this commutator term. Okay. So earlier, if you just multiply these two terms, you'll get the kinetic behavior. But now there's the extra term. There's the product of these two, this with this. So how many gauge fields here? One, two, three. Similarly, one, two, three. So there are products which have three gauge fields. And when you multiply these two together, you will have things which have four gauge fields. Yes? When we are writing up a kinetic term for the vector gauge field, is there a, a reason why Because your F mu nu needs to be addressed. Yes. Well, it has to reduce to what we did earlier. Well, one reason is that you need the commutator. Well, this is the construction which you give you the same as well. D mu commutator. Correct. Covariant derivative of commutator gives you the F mu nu. Yes. So, gives you the phase But you do that in general.
this will give you interaction with four gate modes. So, yes. So you have triple gate vertices coming from these cross sections, and you will have quadruple gate vertices. So, in an abelian gate field like QED, these are not present. So, photons don't interact with themselves, at least at the field, the classical level. But in a non abelian theory, the gate bosons do interact. And you see the W's, which bosons will interact on There's no help. You have to make them massive 
Otherwise, you will not reproduce very nuclearly at low energies. So you can't live with a with non-massive massless W models is not an acceptable theory. Okay, so you, you look at the product. So you wanted the W bosons to be massive to save Fermi theory. But on the at in the low energy limit. To save Fermi theory in the high energy limit, you had to put intermediate vector bosons and you had to get a gate symmetry. The gate symmetry doesn't allow the mass. So there was a time during the late 50s when there was a paradoxical situation. That if you save the low to save the low energy uh, limit of Fermi theory, you needed to have the mass. To save the high energy theory of Fermi, you didn't have, you couldn't have a mass. Okay, so the way out came through spontaneous symmetry. It was realized that these are just two phases. And the Lagrangian can have the symmetry, but the ground state will not. So that brilliant idea was brought in in the 60s, and with that we were able to complete the electric field. So that's the theme of what I'm going to say now and again tomorrow. So to break the symmetry spontaneously, we now replace the scalar mass term as before by a potential. All right? And in the potential, you see, you take the b minus the square, <coughs> so the m squared is an ordinary one. Okay? So this is the usual theory. So this is a mass term with the wrong sign. We replace minus n with minus n to that Now, as before, so let's, I didn't know, I wrote modify. So this uh, phi diagram phi is going to be some of real phase. So ultimately, you can write it as one real phase, eta by x squared. Then we can write the potential very simply as eta squared lambda to the eta form. So you know whether minima will be. There will be a local maximum at eta 0, local minima, same, same potential okay, in eta. And these local minima will correspond to phi divided phi in eta squared, which is the same, same formula. <coughs> okay. Now, recall that phi is phi a phi b. These are complex fields, so let me write them phi 1 plus i phi 2 by root 2, phi 3 plus i phi 4 by root 2. So four fields. And then what is phi diagonal phi? It is clearly phi a mod square plus phi b mod square. And then for that is mod square to this, you have half and then phi 1 square, phi 2 square, phi 3 square, phi 4 square. So if phi diagonal phi is equal to m squared by 2 lambda, then this object here, phi 1 square, this is m squared by lambda. So what is this equation of? It's the equation of four dimensional spheres. Now, remember, for u1, what did we have? We had a circle. All those points were acceptable vector. Now we have a four dimension, four sphere. Any point of that is an acceptable vector. Okay? But only one of these points can be the real vector or the real ground state, which means that you have a hidden symmetry. Same arguments have gone through, now applied in this case also. Okay? Mind what, what did we do in scalar scalar field theory? We had this phi 1 plus i phi 2 by root 2. And remember, the vacuum came somewhere here. I drawn it in the three dimensional picture. And we reoriented the axis so that the phi 1 ran through this. So this was only real. Okay, so the vacuum expectation value of phi was just e by root 2 with no imaginary component. Okay, this is what I did for you one. Let me do a similar thing for, okay, then I shifted. This. So when I shifted it, it was shifted by a real point. This phi is a real point. So for this case, I can do the same. The scalar field, the, the doublet is now like this, and now I have I had the axis in some arbitrary direction, but I have oriented them in such a way now, turned them out so that only phi 3, that's the tradition, gets the vacuum expectation. Okay? So only phi 3 has a vector. So that's the way I have oriented my axis. So I, I, so somehow I knew that the vacuum was going to come there, so I changed my axis. Or if I didn't, I looked where the vacuum was, I went back, changed my coordinate system, and put the vacuum along the real axis. So now this will come as well. So here only phi 3 requires v, so let's start out 0. So when you take the vacuum expectation value, there's only v by root. So now I'll shift again the phi to a phi prime field which is expanded around this vector. Okay, so I could 
شده پای خوره با سکر را پرسید از تو هم شاید جنی اونه نیست از تو جایی هم چیز برنامه 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 برن
consider one voltage source. So let's do the same thing. You can parameterize your phi in a polar form, zero <coughs> here, and into the i phi and t. So the xi is here. With the other thing, you should become voltage. All right? Consider the unbroken Lagrangian density, where we do this. At this level, you are free to make the gate choice. So we make that gate transformation. U of x is this. Phi of x, now you, like you put in this parameterization, you get this. So now there are three equations here. So theta 1, xi 1, theta 2, xi 2, theta 2. So choose all of them suitably. So just choose this as a trend form. Choose these things. This is the same, same as before. But you can make this choice. Once you have made it, your phi becomes now just a zero eta. The Lagrangian has only eta here, and the eta is simple. Ground shape is here, and by root two, so if you shift eta by this, exactly what I did in the morning with u1. It's the same story except you're using matrix. All right, this will lead to the following mass terms. Okay, so mw is half tv. as the correct side mass term for this, and this is a real scalar field, physical scalar field with physical mass. And there are no Goldstone bosons. Again, if I had these eyes, you would have been the Goldstone boson. Now I'm saying you mean if I had done it in a different gauge, you would have this physical Goldstone boson hanging around. And <coughs> these three degrees of freedom three appear in the longitudinal polarizations of the three massive W. Okay, so it's like <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the three Goldstone bosons and all the three matrix. Okay. You can also expand the gauge field matrix now. Okay. In terms of the trees. So remember I wrote W mu plus and W mu minus in terms of these. So you can rewrite this object in terms of the W's. So substitute A mu and just solve for this. And you can write A mu like this. So it can also be written as W mu plus into this generator. So you could regard these as t plus, t minus, and t3. So where have you seen this kind of case? You see the right in the theory of angular momentum. Right? You have done n plus, n minus. You know, it's just like that. So the corresponding gauge bosons are the w plus, w minus, and so that's how you could do that. It's easier to do. So, OK. Now, so this is done with a scalar field. Of course, if you want to describe weak interactions, then you need fermions. After all, in the morning we developed everything with fermions. So let's see what to do with fermions. So once again, you could put a fermion doublet, this is the scalar map. So instead of phi a, and I could have done it for x u n, it's a multiplier of many fermions, they just do it for x u n. So instead of phi a and phi b, I have put now psi a and phi psi a. Two for, they are both two different mass degenerate derived fermions. Mass degenerate. So <coughs> the free Lagrangian density is this. So psi bar means this. The row matrix is both the, so these are Dirac inverts, and then in addition you put the row inverts on the And you write it like this. So if you break it up, if you substitute psi a, psi b here and there also, you get two Dirac free Dirac Lagrangians with equal masses. And under the global S U2 transformation, as before, we go to U. This will go to in dagger. The Lagrangian density is varied at the global SU2 gauge transformation. Same story as before. If you try to upgrade this to a local SU2 gauge invariance, you have to put covariant derivative here. It's much simpler than the other thing. They two covariant derivatives, so I have only one. <coughs> so invariance is guaranteed because you put the covariant derivative and you know that N U will transform in order to make this value with the proper behavior. Expand the covariant derivative. So as before, so from here you get two terms. You already have the mass term. So the mass term and the periodic term you use the three fermion. This is the free gauge part, and this is the interaction part. Okay, they've got similar thing for Q1 also. So this is a little more complicated because now all the W's are sitting in this. Expand the interaction term. Okay, I'll expand your terms. I'll show you how to write this expansion. So you have this into W plus, this into W minus, and this W naught. So we can call this a current coupling to W plus, current coupling to W minus, current coupling to W naught. <coughs> so this J nu plus and minus, J minus 
transitions, these are trans currents, and the J naught is a neutral current. Why is that? Simply because this, if you make an arithmetic transformation, this will transform because this carries a charge. And the Lagrangian, of course, is neutral, so this has a charge, this has a charge. This is neutral, so this is So it's a charged and neutral current. So let's write that explicitly. So you write this. You expand the P1 plus I P2, you can write it like this. Okay, put in the quality this is, and you get this. It's psi bar A, psi B. Z U minus is psi bar B, psi A, you can expect that. <coughs> and J naught has two terms, psi bar A, psi A, psi bar B, psi B. So it's easy to see that the charges, so these two will have few charges. So there's a net charge for this, opposite charge here. And this uh, this charge will cancel, charges of this will cancel. Okay, so let's look at this again. And specifically that's kind of interactions, neutral kind of interactions, and you will get what this is Okay. So A A for the will come to W plus, a complex W0, and this should be W minus, I think. No, W0 will come to both the A's and the B's. Okay, so there are two terms. Either of these two things are possible. One is A and B must be some other kind of particles. 
they are not in the program. But then that is the whole effort because I want to write a theory for those particles. These are some hypothetical particles who know this exist. Or the W cannot be the photon. And that's already hinted by the fact that it is also picking up a mass. So in this uh, formalism, the W cannot be the photon. So this is the okay. So I should explain to you that so Glashow, after doing his PhD, he moved to Caltech as a postdoc. So there, Yelman said, "Why don't you give me a private talk about your thesis?" So Glashow went through all of this and come to you. And this last thing, Gelman pointed out there. That look, if you want this to be weak interactions, then your W naught cannot be the photon. Okay? It just can't be the photon. So you made a mistake somewhere. So poor Glash asked his thesis said collapsed. So he <laughs> went back and then scratched his head, worked very hard for some time, and then came up with the proper theory. <laughs> so to some extent, this development part of the weak theory, there's a contribution from Gelman. Just like Higgs, that contribution is there from somebody, some referee, who was either Bentley or Napo. But here, of course, it is known. Sasha has said it's getting a good question, so they might have lost the contribution. Okay, so let me continue. Let's have another five minutes. So, one thing, of course, Sasha, even if you tried and which you would also say, why not just include the one group as a direct product to this? You just say this W naught is some other neutral W. And the electron is there, it's just there as a separate group. <coughs> so, what the meaning of a direct product group means all the generators, generators of the two separate groups come into this category. It means they are just like separate transformations. <coughs> so, let's try this. So, transformation matrix now would be uh, this one. This is for the SU2 part, and this is for the U1 part, where P prime is the generator U1. I don't know what it means, but the fact that it's a direct product means that this T prime must commute with all the T's. And we've given it some other theta prime, and there will be Q times T, e, which is the charge. Okay? So electromagnetic gate transmission, I'll just put it in my hand together with the SU. Okay. Alright? So gate <coughs> matrix expanded as before, but now there'll be an extra term here where this is the photon field and this is some unknown neutral term. So, give the interaction terms as before. So, if you do that, you will write this, this is the interaction of the W plus and W minus, W naught, and these will be the interactions of the photon. Okay. So, now working back, you could also have written this in terms of matrices. Okay. So, your matrices would look like this. Okay. So, if you expand this matrix, you'll get this. So, now, you could also write this whole thing as psi bar, this whole thing as psi. So you get g times t plus e times t mu t prime. But now you have t prime. What is t prime? You can have qa and qb. So it's not a unit matrix, but it's a diagonal matrix with qa and qb. Okay? So the generator of this I write as qa and qb, which means I could write it like this qa plus qb into 1 and qa minus qb times t. What is t t? 1 minus 1 with a half this. Okay, sigma. So I could write this t prime as some something into 1 and something into t c. But q a minus q b is minus 1. So this is minus 1, so this is minus half t c. But now what happens if you take t prime with the t c? The t c part of it certainly is not going to commute with the other t c, the t1 and t2. But what did we start with? We said it's a direct product, so the T prime will commute with all the T's. You can't have it. Just it won't, it won't work. So therefore, Glashow came to the conclusion we cannot treat the interactions and interactions as separate direct products. Alright? You have to unify them in some way. So the first attempt, or like Glashow's first attempt was if you two and identifying the W naught as the photon, that failed. Second attempt was to just put in the photon separately. That also failed. The third attempt was to put in a completely different interaction and take a combination of that, a unified theory, 
and get the photon out of that. That was the theory which worked. So for that theory, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Okay? So question. In the Higgs mechanism, we have considered potential like phi, uh, some constant phi square minus phi to the four, uh, something like that. Uh, and then we had a uh, like uh, a lot of ground state, possible ground state, and then we pick up one and uh, symmetry is broken spontaneously. And uh, can we can we uh, obtain a Higgs mechanism for potentials like phi to the six or? See, phi to the six we don't write because it could lead to a dimension coupling constant. And if you give a non renormalizable theory, so I think here, you ultimately want a renormalizable and a unitary theory. Those are your requirements. So if your original thing you already know is non renormalizable, then what do the same for? That's why you don't take my I mean, if you consider this as a, I mean, like from a mathematician's point of view, yes. we so didn't. I'll tell you briefly that uh, one very nice idea, Mr. Coleman and Michael, was to take a model where this n is minus n squared is not there at all. You just start with the lambda part for interaction. And then you can show the quantum corrections will generate not only the this term, but also by the six and other terms. So that's called the Coleman mystery. We actually generate that from quantum corrections. The trouble with that is that it gives you a Higgs mass which is in the range of few zero. The Higgs mass is 125. So therefore that theory by itself doesn't work. But some variations of that have been known to work. It may use get many cases. So what you are saying is a very good question. It can actually happen, but uh, those theories will be effective theories. They won't be renormalized theories. Standard model, the beauty of the standard model is it happens to be renormalized. But uh, I mean, the Higgs mechanism can can be uh, uh, can be implemented for those potentials also. You could implement it, you would also generate it. Because you need to generate the Higgs state mass. You would also generate it by putting on a complicated potential. But the whole idea is that you want to keep your ideas. Any other question? Okay, so everything was massless anyway. 
So, <clears throat> any last question? So, if not, so let's thank the speaker. Also, I have an announcement. So, our tutorial will be in 6007. Okay? So, we meet there. Thank you.